Did you know that the Bangladesh Bank filed lawsuits against top banks and executives for their alleged involvement in one of the greatest cyber heists in history? Was it really these banks that schemed the conspiracy against the Bangladesh Bank? Or was there a greater mastermind who pulled the strings behind the scenes of trying to steal nearly $1 billion from the country's tax reserves? As the Bangladesh Bank's door swung open to welcome a flood of customers, the place hummed with the usual activity on Sunday, their first working day. The constant sounds of cluttering keyboards and machines beeping on transactions made the employees forget about the absence of rhythmic noises in the air a printer usually makes before its every print cycle. Was the silent printer just a mere technical hiccup or a clue to a larger diabolical mystery unfolding within the bank's premises? But the watchful guards would have promptly detected any suspicious entry into the bank's restricted area, don't you think? Only this time the attack was digital. This is the story of the meticulously planned Bangladeshi bank heist, where an elite group of cyber criminals known as the Lazarus Group left the world scratching their heads for the attack they orchestrated on Bangladesh's central bank computer systems. In a matter of minutes, the hackers were done with siphoning off millions of dollars from a country's reserves. On Sunday, the 7th of February 2016, the Bangladesh Bank employees returned to start a new work week after the bank's official off days of Friday and Saturday. They were met with a chilling discovery. The printer was not working. Finding the printer tray empty after the weekend sent a shiver down their spines, prompting the director of the bank to rush to the restricted department of accounts and budgeting office. This was no ordinary printer for miscellaneous office use. It was an automated printer linked with the banking software Swift, designed to work 24-7 and provide real-time printing of bank transactions. After restoring the printer to its working state, the bank employees watched in horror as 35 payment orders, which they had no recollection of sending, began to fill up the tray. A staggering amount of money, millions of dollars to be precise, had been transferred to various bank accounts worldwide. The situation had indeed taken a suspicious turn. The Central Bank of Bangladesh, like many other national banks, manages its foreign currency reserve by maintaining an account with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This arrangement uses SWIFT, Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, for communication between foreign banks. Developed in the 1970s in Belgium, the trusted software operating under the National Bank of Belgium and a committee comprising representatives from prominent entities, including the U.S. Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, Japan, and other countries, helps the bank in managing foreign exchange accounts with withdrawals and money transfers. With thousands of users and daily proceedings in millions, the SWIFT system is highly secured and ready for these cyber challenges thrown at it. By employing unique identifier codes of either 8 or 11 characters for each member organization, SWIFT uses distinct messaging services to facilitate the straight-through processing of transactions. But despite being the safest option for foreign currency transfer, SWIFT can't guarantee immunity from security breaches, as that depends on the internal cybersecurity systems and protocols of the national banks. And this is exactly what the Lazarus Group took advantage of. But who exactly was behind this Lazarus group? If you go back in time and start looking for high-profile cyber attacks worldwide, you'll find one common name linked with cyber heists since the year 2009. The Bangladesh heist was another walk in the park for the Lazarus group, as this shady team of unknown number of members had been one of those cybercrime groups that had scammed the world multiple times with its disruptive hacking powers. With every heist they had pulled off, the Lazarus group tested the limits of their capabilities and skills. From 2009's Operation Troy to 2013's South Korea cyber attack and 2014's Sony attack, every time the Lazarus group stepped up to do something more grand than the last time. Before the Bangladesh heist, the 2014 Sony attack was their most notable campaign that shook the entire company to its foundation. The hackers, calling themselves the Guardians of Peace, stole huge amounts of data from Sony Pictures Entertainment's network, blackmailing via leaking embarrassing exchanges among Sony employees to journalists and, by using their communiques, the hackers had quite an unexpected demand. 
They did all this illegal hacking to threaten Sony Pictures to cancel their scheduled release of the comedic film The Interview, which revolved around the plot of the assassination of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un by two Americans. At first, decision makers at Sony actually put the movie on hold, but after critics including President Obama cautioned that being afraid of terrorist threats would establish a troubling precedent, the studio later decided to release the film in limited theatrical screenings and online. With the US government's doubts about involvement of North Korea, the attack had the potential to affect American foreign policy in the landscape of future warfare. The critics were right. Their fear of cyber attacks affecting countries on a large scale actually came true. With time, the Lazarus Group transitioned to bank robberies and devastating attacks on cryptocurrency, cybersecurity, and pharmaceutical companies. One can only wonder how many other high-profile targets they have on their radar next. Going back to January 2016, the incident that led to the heist a month later involved an employee of the Bangladesh Bank who innocently opened a corrupted email. The man didn't know he had unknowingly set in motion one of the greatest setbacks the nation's central bank would face. By enabling malicious software to hijack the bank's computer system, the Lazarus Group successfully infiltrated the bank's confidential data, laying the groundwork for their audacious scheme. It was now time for the hackers to implement the plan they had hitched months ago. After all, deceiving Swift wasn't going to be child's play. Previously, on the 15th of May 2015, five accounts under different names and a deposit of $500 each were made at Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation in the Philippines. Determined to ensure the smooth operation of their heist, the hackers even made some fake accounts with Philippine pesos as a backup. At the same time, they tested their malware and hacking skills by attempting attacks on SWIFT systems of different banks. Capitalizing on strategic timing and global banking schedules, the hackers executed their heist with attention to detail. 4th of February 2016 was indeed not a random day when they had chosen to rob the bank. With Sunday off for U.S. banks, including the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Thursday and Friday marking the weekend in Bangladesh and the Chinese New Year, not so coincidentally marking a bank holiday on Monday in the Philippines, the hackers had more than enough time to execute the perfect plan. The plan was simple. The hackers waited for the Bangladesh Bank's closure on Thursday to dispatch the 35 fake payment orders totaling nearly $1 billion to the New York Fed to be transferred to accounts in Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and some other parts of Asia. On the 5th of February 2016, they then hacked the automated printer, logged out of the bank's SWIFT system, and initiated the malware to start wiping off the evidence. The New York Fed was quick to process four out of the 35 pay orders in the RCBC's correspondent accounts at Citibank and Wells Fargo. The Bank of New York Mellon via the Fedwire system, which was quick to transfer the funds to the Philippines on the very same business day. The hackers were successful in directing $81 million to the four accounts they previously opened in RCBC, along with the single request for an additional $20 million sent to Pan-Asia Banking. All this happened before the Bangladesh Bank employees could get back from the weekend and attempt to contact the bank to halt the transactions. However, even if they had managed to do so, their efforts would have been in vain, as Sunday, the first weekday in Bangladesh, was an off day in the US, so no bank employees in the US would have responded before Monday. For the $81 million sent to RCBC in the Philippines, the Bangladesh Bank and SWIFT had requested RCBC to halt the funds if they had already been transferred to them. But Monday, being the Chinese New Year holiday in the Philippines, didn't help. The $81 million was sadly laundered through casinos with no possibility of recovery. But thankfully, those $20 million sent to Singapore were recovered because of a spelling mistake in the name of the account holder. Had it not been the Shakila Foundation instead of Shalika Foundation, Bangladesh most likely would have lost the full $1 billion. The rest of these suspicious transactions were promptly put on hold by the New York Fed before Sunday to seek correspondence from Bangladesh Bank, saving a whopping $851 million of the country's financial reserves from falling into the hands of the Lazarus Group. A comprehensive investigation was launched with international law enforcement agencies and cybersecurity experts joining forces. The involvement of multiple intermediary banks in laundering the stolen money had made it super difficult to track the stolen funds 
and the digital trails of the Lazarus Group. At first, the Bangladesh Bank couldn't believe that their system had been breached until the World Informatrix Cybersecurity's forensic investigation revealed the invisible tiptoe footprints of the hackers. It turned out that the international hackers matched the pattern of a similar bank robbery that happened in Bangladesh in 2013. Involving the theft of 250,000 US dollars, the nearly forgotten cold case of the Sonalai Bank robbery was reviewed by the Bangladesh police. The bank had reported the heist to SWIFT back in 2013, but the attempts to recover the stolen funds were unsuccessful. The cyber thieves had used similar tactics of installing keylogger software to gain passwords and sent fraudulent payment orders via the SWIFT system. With another twist in the story came the existence of two Chinese middlemen who were involved in moving the $81 million into Philippine casinos. As the inquiry in Manila dug deeper, startling revelations emerged. The dollar accounts that the hackers had opened in the Philippines nine months prior to the heist were opened by these two individuals. They were also responsible for depositing a portion of the stolen funds converted into Philippine pesos into the bank account of Kim Wong, the casino's operator. As if the pre-existing twists in the tale weren't enough, the federal prosecutors in the United States unveiled startling connections between the heist and North Korea. Suspicions of a bank employee being an accomplice and the possibility of a state-sponsored cyber attack were literally two polar ends. Their claims pointed toward the North Korea-based Lazarus Group, which had a long history of leading similar theft attacks. The group's use of a particular IP address and the embedded Korean language and the malware coding definitely put weight on the federal prosecutor's claims. With computer security researchers who linked the Bangladesh bank heist to 11 other cyber attacks done by North Korean hackers, if they had been proven, North Korea would have become the first to use the forbidden powers of cybersecurity to steal money at the state level. With the question of accountability looming large, who's actually to blame? Was it solely the fault of the hackers who had the guts to orchestrate the cyber attack that siphoned off millions of dollars from Bangladesh's reserves? Or did accountability extend to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for approving the money transfer without confirmation from Bangladesh Bank? The New York Fed had a valid counter-argument at its disposal. Amidst the finger-pointing and accusations by the Bangladesh Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York stressed the fact that they did their job which included reaching out to the Bangladesh Bank to query and authenticate a large number of suspicious transfers, but they received no response. According to authorities at the Reserve Bank, their workers adhered to proper protocols by approving the five transfers that ultimately passed scrutiny and blocking the 30 others they found suspicious. The Bangladesh Bank also took legal action against RCBC and around 18 other individuals and organizations at the U.S. court. The bank claimed that the RCBC employees executed the payment orders despite having doubts regarding the SWIFT instructions. The central bank of the Philippines fined RCBC 1 billion pesos for non-compliance with banking laws and regulations. While RCBC agreed to pay the imposed fine, they also threatened to file a countersuit against Bangladesh Bank for defamation. So, what do you think happened to SWIFT software in the aftermath of the heist? The central target of the Lazarus Group was the exploitation of the SWIFT system, and they were actually quite successful in exposing its vulnerabilities and loopholes that had been oversighted before the Bangladesh Bank heist. To make sure the system ran swiftly in the future, the SWIFT system developers had to undergo a major overhaul to strengthen the exposed gaps in the infrastructure of their cybersecurity. The forensic analysis and digital traces revealed how the Lazarus Group made hacking a system sound easy, from initiating the heist with the classic trick of sending corrupted emails, to cunningly manipulating the SWIFT system. The Lazarus Group had put everyone in cybersecurity to work, leaving them no choice but to come up with new reforms in the messaging system. SWIFT even made an agreement with Bangladesh's central bank to assist in the reconstruction of its infrastructure following the $81 million heist. Apart from undisclosed settlements and the recovery of the $15 million from a gaming junket operator in the Philippines, Bangladesh was unable to reclaim the stolen funds. What are your thoughts on this heist marking the dawn of a new era in cyber warfare? Comment down below and make sure to like and subscribe.